Good morning, everyone. Um, hi, I'm Betsy, and I'm going to be your MC today in Kaya Theatre, um, and tomorrow as well. So, um, wasn't that an amazing keynote? I've like noted down a lot of things to look up and read and so on. Um, but we have so many more exciting talks today. Um, oh, and I should um, also, uh, in introducing myself, mention that um, I am um, working on this conference for you today um, from the lands of the Yagara people in Brisbane, um, and I acknowledge their elders past and present. Um, and yeah, it's a beautiful day outside here. I hope it's lovely conference day where you all are as well. So first up today, um, we have Case Cook. So Case has been working with free software since 1994, has been a Debian developer since 2007, and has been a member of the Linux Kernel Technical Advisory Board since 2019. He is currently employed as a Linux Kernel Security Engineer by Google, focusing on upstream kernel security defenses. So Case will be taking questions today. So if you'd like to put your questions during the talk in the little questions tab at the top of the chat in Venulus there, um, the question are moderated so your question won't appear right away you've got to wait for one of us volunteers to manage to approve it um, and also check in with that questions tab regularly during the talk because you can upvote questions that you want answered um, so I'll see you back at the end of the talk to pass on your questions um, case we're looking forward to hearing from you awesome thanks for having me um... Hi, uh, as, as said, I'm Case Cook, uh, here to talk to you about uh, some of the work we're doing in Linux kernel uh, for actually doing some meaningful bounds checking. Um, I'll just dive in. So I got more and more irritated by some of the uh, flaws that were cropping up in the kernel around buffer overflows, um, and I wanted to see if there was a way we could actually put a stop to this. Um, so I, as a sort of data analysis step, I looked at the last, you know, three years or so of any of the kernel CVs that mentioned buffer overflow and tried to root cause them and figure that out. Um, so the, you know, one of the largest, not the largest, but I'll get through it first, is the array index overflows. Um, and looking at that, there were seven out of those 25 um, that we looked at. and. The, the good news is, like using an example here, um, that these are pretty well solvable. So if you look at this example, oops, um, you've, got, you've got this algorithm name that was 64 bytes long. And if you were to access it um, beyond the 64 bit, if there's no instrumentation, it would just happily access memory beyond the end of, of that buffer and uh, you know, badness would ensue. Um, but if you actually build the kernel with UBSAN bounds um, and either trap or the panic on warn syscontrol set, uh, this doesn't happen anymore. All, all these kinds of things uh, on, on known sized array indexing get caught. Um, for example, you can see a little summary of what would happen here if you get, you actually get an array index out of bounds at runtime, um, and it would either uh, trap that process or trap that thread of execution with UBSAN trap, or it would panic the whole system uh, if you set panic on warn. Um, though in, the, in this particular example um, that got changed from a fixed size array to a flexible array, uh, which means you actually lose any kind of bounds checking that the compiler can do. Uh, so that's not the best uh, fix for it, but uh, it's 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 a reasonable example for showing what that would have looked like. Um, so all of these just go away if if the kernel is compiled with UBSAN bounds. So that array index overflow section sort of goes away. You don't have buffer overflows uh, like that anymore. And so what's left is uh, this the huge section where memcopy is used against uh, a buffer. Um, and looking through those 11, the one that set me off uh, really was this one, uh, which was called Bleeding Tooth, which uh, was a Bluetooth vulnerability. And it just annoyed me to no end because again, the compiler knows how big this buffer is and yet it does no bounds checking 
whatsoever. Uh, and if we look through the others, you sort of see this same pattern over and over. Here's a, an entire structure. We know how big it is, and we're going to copy into it. But it's unchecked at runtime. Here's another one where we know the size of that buffer, and there's no runtime checking. And again, um, these just sort of continue, and you, you see the pattern over and over. Um, in fact, this became so common in the last couple of years that... Uh, there's a couple at the end where you see we've got SSIDs. People started looking at this as a common overflow uh, place. And now we've got SSID overflow and another one. This one doesn't even have a CVE assigned, but it's fixed. And another one, so that's three in a row of exactly the same flaw, all of which the compiler knows how big this buffer is, and yet it happily just clobbers past the end of it. Um, so, some of you may be thinking, well, wait a second, I thought config fortify source solved this. Um, and, well, let's answer that question. If you take a look at what the fortified memcopy looks like, um, this top part is where we basically get the size of the object. What's the destination size? What's the source size? Uh, this next chunk is the compile time portion where, that says, hey, if we know the size that we're going to be copying at compile time, then it's a fixed size. We can actually do the checking immediately and throw a compile time warning rather than doing a runtime warning. Uh, and then finally, if those weren't, uh, if it wasn't a built-in constant, then we can do the runtime checking. And uh, if everything is fine, we go on and actually do the mem copy. Uh, so the the problem actually lies in this, which is the built-in object size uh, call, which where, where we say, how big is our destination? Um, and so we dive into built-in object size a little bit more. That last parameter is what mode to be using. Um, in mode zero, we're actually measuring the outer structure, not what's being referenced directly, not the member itself. Um, as an example, um, we can see here in this structure, if we ask for a uh, built-in object size of count in mode zero, we actually get the answer of 16 because that's the full size of the remaining everything after from count on uh, is how much is left. And this is the block uh, having a mem copy go beyond the end of a structure, but it doesn't help uh, a mem copy block going beyond the end of a structure member. Um, but we see in mode one, we actually get the true size of count as four and we can see all our you know, each of these. As an example here, you know, we say, well, how big is name? Well, it's not eight as far as in mode zero, it's 12, which means, well, we could clobber or read the secret value that follows it. Uh, whereas in mode one, we'd actually limit it. And if we have a dynamically sized array at the end or what's called a flexible array, um, a built-in object size refuses to know anything about it. It says, I don't know, minus one. I don't know how big this is at all. Um, and what actually happened with the bleeding tooth attack is uh, it was attacking stuff within the same composite structure just past the end of the, the buffer that was uh, being used by the mem copy. So specifically this last uh, advertised, uh, advertised data, uh, it wrote past it and clobbered the, the list head uh, for next and continued its attack. So that's an example of you know going past one and hitting some secret thing that you didn't want to expose. But the memcopy was perfectly happy to do it because it wasn't past the end of the HCI dev structure itself. So back to fortified memcopy. Obviously, the solution here is we need to fix the built-in object size and switch the modes um, and actually have it say mode one. That's obviously what we need to do. So I guess we're done. So here's my wall of text. Um, if we look at the memcopy calls on a recent x86-64 all mod config build, um, which doesn't really represent, uh, I don't know, a real world case. It mostly represents worst case. This is all the code that could be built. There's about 35,000 memcopy calls in total, 22,000 where we don't know the buffer destination buffer size at all, uh, 12,000 where we know both, so we can actually validate them at compile time. So we know that those 33% are always going to be correct. Uh, and then about you know 1,200, uh, only 
where the destination buffer size is known, but the copy size is dynamic and you know evaluated runtime. And going through that list of CVEs, all 11 of them were in this 3%. So if we actually can fix this, we would have solved all of those buffer overflows, um, which uh, was very exciting because when I first ran these numbers, it was it, it seemed like we were going to run into trouble and that we wouldn't actually fix the big the big problem, but uh, it turns out the bulk of it comes from this case. Uh, but of course, that would be too easy to switch to mode one. Um, of those 12,000 or so uh, known buffer size and known copy size, um, some of those actually need to be fixed because the kernel would intentionally overflow member targets. Um, the good news if there is some in that was that they would appear at compile time. So it was easy to sort of catch them all. And so what do I mean by intentional cross member overflows? Uh, what we'd have is uh, this kind of example where we've, we've got a, a mem copy that's targeting um, this key material member. So that's what the compiler sees. That's what it looks at. And when the built-in object size runs with mode one, it says, okay, key material is max anchor key length long. And then it looks at key M len and it sees, you know, oh, we've actually asked for all three of these fields because we're gonna copy out of some source and intentionally overwrite, you know, do three writes at once is basically what's going on here. Um, and the, the kernel had kind of a lot of these and we can't move on to doing runtime checking if we can't even build the kernel in the first place to deal with uh, these cases either. So uh, sort of the traditional solution is you let the compiler have some new way to refer to all three of these members under one name. Um, this is an example of adding a name structure uh, around these three and then suddenly you can say, oh, okay, we're gonna car target the TKIP, um, and the, you know, the length we're copying in is correct. Everything's, everything's fine, we're good. Uh, but when we add a named structure like this, because we, we, again, we need to be able to name it so that the mem copy has a target in mind for its destination. Suddenly we have to remove all the references to the key material member and replace it with its now full name, which is the, you know, the, the added structure name dot key material. And doing that for every instance uh, of each of those members, for every member that gets wrapped in a structure, uh, was going to be uh, unpalatable, shall we say, to, to upstream. Uh, it would be an enormous amount of churn. Um, so uh, with, uh, with Keith, Pather Keith Packard's help, uh, I uh, added struct group as a macro that would actually give us both. You could refer to things either by its original name or by its wrapped name. So you'd have both um, both ways of referring to things. So you could change, you could add your mem copy, uh, but you wouldn't have to rewrite the rest of all the references to it. Uh, this works through an interesting uh, trick, uh, which is it's the struct group is actually a macro that creates a union of both an anonymous struct and a named structure, but they have identical members. So they'd have the same locations. So each of them, the, they're basically alias to each other. Um, and this, this works really well. There are some additional helpers for adding attributes uh, and tags to, to the created union um, and the structures within them, stuff like that. Um, but this solves the problem of getting us uh, a, a name, a single name that we can use to refer to a group of sub-members within a structure without disrupting the rest of the kernel. Um, so now we can say, all right, we've got, you know, mcopy runtime checking is now possible. We can just do this. We can do the built-in object size uh, with mode one, just like we thought uh, we could do. And um, what happens here then is, again, at, at compile time, we're looking at the size. Uh, and for, the, for those cases, the size is known at compile time. And we get the correct, uh, we you know, pass the read and write overflows. 
uh, chat tests here. And we can move on to actually triggering stuff at runtime. The problem, of course, here is that we need to uh, deal with similar multi-member overwrites at runtime. There are those in the kernel as well that aren't visible at compile time. Um, and that means that instead of just panicking, we actually have to compare uh, the mode 0 object size and the mode 1 object size. And if we have encountered a, you know, a new version of this with mode 1, uh, you know, the, the more constrained version, we can't panic the system anymore uh, because it used to work. And now if we just suddenly say, never mind, we'll panic the system every time you're doing the thing that you've been doing for forever since memcopy used to allow it, um, that's not going to fly either. So the, now we've had to split these tests and say, if it's a mode zero failure, go ahead and panic because that's what we've been doing forever. Um, and on mode one, we can issue a warning. Uh, and the idea is, as we make our way through uh, development process and running these kernels in, under real world workloads, uh, we can collect those warnings, find the places where that's happening uh, and fix them up. Um, the other thing is we can instrument these and find them in advance. Um, so that's some of the work uh, that I've been doing is trying to go through and find these cases where it's happening at runtime um, and, and differentiate them from the places uh, that are where we don't know the size of the buffer at all uh, and getting people to find these on their own rather than just being surprised by a warning that suddenly appears. Um, another approach to this has been running these kinds of instrumented kernels under syscall or under fuzzing, things like that. So we have a, a an advanced warning about getting getting and fixing these cases um, so that we don't end up with the surprises. So now we're done. Oh, but no, wait a second. Let's go back and look at that list again. So while we've handled this, you know, the what looked like this tiny case of, you know, 3% or so, um, but that did cover all the CVs in the past three years, we realistically can't ignore the fact that more than half of these memcopy uses are against uh, destination sizes, uh, buffer sizes that aren't known to the compiler. They're entirely dynamic. Um, and we, we really, to, you know, to seriously deal with buffer overflows, we need to address this as well. Um, so that's a big part of that are the, f the, the flexible array case that I talked about a little bit earlier. And in those cases, if you remember, built-in object size returns minus one. It says, I don't know how big this is. Um, so these cases where I'm showing that I've got highlighted with this with the destination and source sizes are, are, are never true because we can't know the size for the destination and it'll just fall straight through to the underlying mem copy. Um, to give you sort of an example of this and talk a little bit about the flexible uh, flexible arrays. You know, here's an example of some bitmap image, and we've got a count of pixels, uh, and then we've got our pixel data, which is not byte size; it's u32. And if we ask built-in object size how big is pixel data, it says I don't know, and you can't even you can't even use size of on it. Uh, this is actually considered an invalid expression because it's a flexible array and can't be known at compile time, and size of needs to be evaluatable at compile time. Um, however, flexible arrays are a relatively recent addition to the C language standard. Um, and before that, there were fake flexible arrays. And the kernel, of course, is filled with that because it has an old code base. And the, one of them, the most, the more recent fake flexible arrays is the zero element array. So this is a GNU uh, C extension. But built-in object size also considers this to be a flexible array. So we can't even detect these very easily. However, size of happily considers this to be zero uh, bytes long. So even if we could somehow manage to use size of, it would freak out. Uh, before that was the really old style, which was a one element array. And this was uh, what, you know, what C did before that and just totally stepped on itself and uh, but built an object size again says, I don't know, uh, this looks like it's probably a flexible array, so I refuse to believe how big it is, even though size of again is happily 
says, oh yeah, it's uh, U32. Cool, cool, that's, that's four bytes. But of course, if I change this to some large value, it is also treated as a flexible array. So any array at the end of a structure is treated as a flexible array, which is really frustrating because it limits the ability of, uh, of our kernel to be able to do any kind of bounds checking on something that isn't a flexible array. So the goal here is, as this corner case exists, is to fix this by basically switching built-in object size around to refuse to um, believe that trailing arrays are flexible arrays. Only true flexible arrays are flexible arrays. This doesn't exist yet for the compiler. Uh, the expectation is we we can add this option uh, and, and gain back some coverage for things. So in the meantime, if you have an array that you want protected in your data structure, please don't put it at the end of your structure. Um, Right, so continuing to use that, um, we, we need to be able to solve dynamically sized destination overflows. Uh, the good news is that the bounds of these things are stored somewhere. Uh, it just takes checking it. Um, and the better news with flexible arrays is that that is usually stored somewhere nearby, usually in the same structure as, uh, as the flexible array itself. And certainly many call sites already try to check the bounds, but there's always going to be bugs in open coded checks. Um, and even within that, how many of these places are remembering to check the storage size of the variable that contains the bounds? Like in this example, the pixels count is a U16. That's not a size T, it's not a 64-bit value, it's small. So what happens if you try to store something that's too big in it? Um, what I'd really like to see in the future for the C standard is to actually uh, provide the compiler with a way to reason about the bounds um, so they can do things in a dynamic fashion. Uh, this exists in some other languages where you can actually hint to the compiler what is being used to track, to track the size of flexible array. Um, for example, this style of, of syntax uh, has been proposed you say pixel data, but it's controlled, you know, its size is going to be found in the pixels um, member. And then the compiler can actually reason about the bounds and do sanity checking and other things uh, where, where the other options already exist to do sanity checking. It can extend it and cover uh, the flexible array cases too. Um, so instead of relying on the compiler and, um, and these other missing C features, uh, we're basically forced to create a new API and then disallow uh, memcopy for destinations that aren't a constant size, uh, that aren't a, a size known at compile time, um, to really cut that 60% down uh, dramatically by, by replacing the API and not use memcopy and, and uh, move on to new things. So continuing to use this bitmap um, image example, you know, here's sort of what things look like if it's open coded. We've got some, some count, uh, we're gonna allocate storage for it, we're gonna assign how, you know, how many pixels there are and we're gonna copy the screen data off into this. But of course, every single one of these steps, this count, that could overflow. What are those types? Who knows? Um, at least we're, this example is using struct size, which should do the right thing as far as calculating a, a correct size. Uh, but if count has already overflowed, mm, that's not gonna do the right thing. Here we've got a size T count being assigned to a U16 pixels, so that could go wrong. Uh, and then our mem copy is gonna do another open coded uh, multiplication of the data size of that, of that member times a count. Uh, so each one of these pieces can go wrong, and there's, you know, in this example, no checking of any of those cases. So if we can replace all of this with a standard API that actually does all of that, uh, all of those checks, we can actually um, just get rid of a whole bunch of this and just collapse it into what is effectively deserialization. We're taking some string of bits uh, out of memory and stuffing it into uh, this you know uh, array of some data type, so it's it's a form of deserialization, uh, and then we can throw out this uh, all the open coded stuff and um, and get it. Of course, I've left uh, the width times height overflow uh, for the future. Uh, 
uh, since we want to be able to, uh, we need to be able to catch integer overflows too, but that's a whole separate talk. So there's other helpers uh, that we can add as well for cases where the allocation has already occurred. So here's an allocation that has occurred and we've got the, the size, you know, how many of those members exist is already part of the structure and we can just do the deserialization again. Uh, but instead of doing the allocation, we can actually check the size and do all the other things. It's actually more work to do this uh, than, than to do the allocation because we already did the checks on the allocation size. Um, so what does that look like? So uh, the first part is creating a helper to actually deal with uh, clamping the size of the data type to the data type storage for a given member. Uh, and just walking through here really quickly, we, we uh, extract, uh, or rather get a 64-bit representation of the counts uh, that we've got. We use another existing macro to actually find out how large uh, a value the given member can can store. So it you know it actually goes through and says, oh, is this a signed 16-bit uh, value? Well, it can't store the the full two bytes. It's one bit short of that because it's signed and basically it does it has all of that logic involved. Uh, so we can actually extract that and says hey, if you're trying to store a count that exceeds the storage of this member, we're going to freak out and, and truncate it um, and you know warn about it and return a safe value that can actually be represented um, by, that, uh, by that one. And uh, I showed that first because it's basically the first thing that the mem to flex dupe would do is uh, we've got this pointer. We're going to make sure we have a safe value that we can store we're going to calculate using struct size helper again how many bytes it will take to store the beginning of the structure plus you know source count many members following it and then we're going to try to allocate that size if an overflow in in this occurs uh, struct size uh, becomes a size t max and kmalloc will refuse to excuse me will refuse to allocate that so we will not get the allocation uh, in the next, in the test, which is why we're uh, checking for that. And then we can figure out how many bytes you want to copy. Um, and we wipe the beginning of the structure and then copy over uh, what we want uh, that we're deserializing and then set the, the member count. Uh, if you're very astute, you may notice uh, in the setting of the, the member count, we're using this from CPU function that got passed into the macro. Sometimes these um, flexible arrays are stored, uh, their, their bounds are stored not in native CPU uh, storage uh, because they're being used, they're being passed to you know, devices or being passed over the network or doing other things. So the bounds are tend to be stored, not necessarily in CPU native format. So we actually have to pass in a, a conversion function here. That's not the general case, but that uh, is needed for enough of them that uh, it's, it's, a, it's now an option for this. And then the big one, which doesn't do the allocation, but it has to actually verify the sizes of things uh, it's going to copy. Um, so this does the same clamping at the beginning, um, figures out the destination uh, you know, how many can we actually store? And this one does a two CPU because it may not be stored in, in CPU native form. Um, so we know how many count uh, we can store to the destination. We calculate the full size of the structure plus its trailing members. And then we do the same again for the source and compare the destination and source and yell very loudly if it's overflowed and, and truncate it if it were going to overflow. Then we can do the mem copy, uh, which you know we've safely we've actually verified now, um, and then set the the new member uh, to the current size, and then return that pointer again. So that does the bulk of that work, and that should get us through that other sixty six percent pretty pretty well. It won't cover everything in there because we'll still have uh, open strings and other stuff, but the the vast majority of the problem is is the flexible array members. Um, there's other cases where there are other bounds. You know, a single string allocation has a bounds somewhere. Uh, so we'll 
as we make our way through the remaining the remainder of that 66 percent we'll probably uh, add more apis as we go but this is what's on the schedule uh, as far as protecting the kernel um, and i say schedule because here we are sort of looking at where things are and and, and uh, what it takes to get things converted so 5.16 was released uh, January 9th, and that has the struct group macro and its related helpers are, are in it. Um, and almost all of the flexible array conversions where we converted from the ancient style, you know, one element array being used, you know, being lied to, um, and zero element arrays uh, being converted to a proper flexible array so we can actually, the compiler can start to reason about it uh, better. Um, those are almost almost completely landed there. Um, for 5.17, uh, which the merge window is open right now, um, all the struct group conversions uh, using that new macro um, have landed so that we can start adding um, uh, the next step would, of course, be enforcement. But um, uh, And then there's array bounds, which I haven't mentioned until now. Um, this is another case of the compiler being able to check the size of, of objects for things beyond just memcopy. Um, it'll actually do uh, direct uh, direct accesses on structures. It'll, it'll check to see where how large the allocation or how large it thinks the object is. Um, so it's related to the built-in object size. Almost all those are finally fixed, so we can turn that back on. Um, so hopefully by 5.18 in May, um, we can enable the compile time memcopy enforcement. Um, so we don't have any more of those cross-member or beyond-member uh, overflows sneaking their way into the kernel. Um, and hopefully the flexible array uh, helpers that I talked about in the previous three slides um, will start landing there, uh, and those conversions can begin. And then hopefully on f in July for 5.19, uh, we can en enable the runtime mcopy enforcement. Uh, so we've, we would have had a release where we can get through finding a bunch of those and fixing them so we can turn them on. And hopefully then we will come out of this year with a vastly improved buffer overflow defense in the kernel um, that everyone can actually use when they turn on Fortify Source. Uh, my goal would actually be make Fortify Source, Fortify Source uh, a default. Um, there's no good reason not to have it on. It's like if you don't have it on, you just want to get owned for some reason. Um, so I've got uh, a little bit of time left over. Um, if you've got any questions or feedback, uh, now's a good time. I think we're going to go through any questions that came up or answer anything uh, that's there. So thank you for your attention. Um, you can uh, get the slides here and email me or see me on Twitter. So thank you. Hi, thank you, Kate. Um, mm -hmm. I tried my best to, to follow that. I haven't even looked at C in years, so it was a challenge, <laughs> but it was eye-opening. So thank you so much. And sure. judging from the chat, there were quite a lot of people who were able to follow it much better than I was. <laughs> um, so there are quite a few questions here. So everyone, please go um, upvote the questions you want to make sure we get time for, um, and I'll start in on them. Uh, so the top question right now is, what is the actual use case for built-in object size foo zero? I'm struggling to imagine what the use case for mode zero is. Um, so mode zero, the difference was inter-object and intra-object. So being able to block a memcopy beyond the edge of a structure. So you wouldn't have an overflow from a memcopy from one structure into the next structure. Um, Mostly it's there for the reasons I outlined and all the gotchas we had within the kernel is that the C source, uh, like C sources have been abusing memcopy for so long uh, by doing this intentional overflow, um, but overflow didn't tend to go beyond the end of a structure. Um, so you'd had, you know, this, you know, inexact form where you'd say, sure, sure, we can know the size of it for this, but we can't go beyond it. Um, and then we can tighten it, and once we've, you know, eliminated all of the cases in a in a given tree uh, of of that kind of thing, uh, and that was 
if I'm remembering correctly, I think that for uh, user space builds um, like glibc, uh, stuff like that, where fortify source had two modes, which was uh, fortify source equals one, which would actually be mode zero for uh, the BOS, and fortify source equals two would actually be mode one for BOS. So it was mostly about uh, having a migration path towards a stricter code base. It's amazing how um, hearing about, I guess, historical patterns of use and misuse kind of influence it's, all of the, the really technical details of things and how, yeah, how changes it gets are made. Painful. <laughs> it's fascinating. Um, all right, next question. How did you find and categorize these 30,000 or so uses of mem copy? Um, oh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, that's that's probably probably the easiest part of it. Um, uh, but let's see if I can go up through slides and show. If we look at the here we go uh, in in the in the mem copy fortified mem copy we we can actually see the the different states. We can see when we have a dynamic size versus a constant size when we know the size or not. Um, so we can emit warnings. Uh, in each of these cases, because this is an inline function, so for e if we if we add a warning like we do for the the write overflow and read overflow functions here, um, we'll actually throw uh, a compile time. Uh, well, that, those will throw a compile time error, but if you do a compile time warning, um, you can actually build build the entire tree, and then you just catch all the warnings and collate them at the end and just look at them because you'll have one warning for each use of memcopy in each of the different states. Um, so that that's actually pretty straightforward, but it's also why I said for the all mod config build isn't strictly a representation of the real world, but it is the worst case scenario. Great, it's, yeah. That, that does sound easier than I was expecting it to be. <laughs> um, okay. How do you enforce the usage of the new macros like struct group and new code? Um, so this is one of the painful parts of, of making these migrations in the kernel uh, is there isn't really a good way to enforce it until everything's done. Um, so really, it's mostly a matter of uh, educating people, um, adding checks where where it's possible in in the compiler as we slowly make our way through various subsystems. Um, adding because there's a, a check patch Perl script that tries to do some sanity checks on patches that are being uh, proposed for the kernel, so that could you know warn about hey, it looks like this isn't known or something. Um, you should try using the new API. So it's mostly about education and other things. But once you get to a, a, a tipping point, really, you can we can actually modify this mem copy again to say, oh, hey, I have a destination size out of built-in object size that says minus one. We don't even allow that to build anymore. And then suddenly you, you the only thing you can do is use that API. Um, I don't expect that to happen anytime soon. Um, but we can use similar instrumentation to how I, I pulled the numbers on, on uses and see like how much you know how 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 much further do we have? What's missing? What else can we fill in? Okay, our next question is: Are distribution kernels usually compiled with Fortify Source currently? Yes, um, as far as I know, every distribution I've seen has Fortify Source enabled for their uh, for their kernels. Um, almost no one is using um, config UBSAN bounds right now. The only one I know of is Android. Uh, so the kernel on Android is is you know blocking array index overflows, but no one else is yet. Um, I've been kind of uh, harassing the, the Ubuntu kernel team nicely uh, to turn that on. Um, they ran into problems with uh, out of tree modules actually doing the wrong thing. Like they were, they had bugs in them, so they had to turn it off. You know, the, some, some driver that people would load would instantly crash the system because they were actually accessing their own stuff uh, with the wrong indexes. Uh, but as those get fixed, we can, hopefully more distros will turn that on. Um, somewhat related, 
Is there any particular list, news site, etc., to follow for new, safer copy semantics as they land in the kernel? Um, I would say LWN usually has a lot of uh, write-ups on, on new developments as they're coming. Um, there's also uh, some kernel documentation in the process docs on, on deprecated um, interfaces and APIs and language uh, forms. And that's probably a good place to look as as we remove stuff <laughs> from the kernel, um, like disallowing variable length arrays and, and doing other stuff. Uh, that ends up going into the deprecated uh, documentation. So it says, you know, you can't, can't do these things anymore. And most of them get enforced uh, by compiler options. We've still got a few more questions, and we've got, I think, just under five minutes to go. So we'll just okay. keep going with your questions. Thanks, everyone, sure. for posting so many questions. You've got a really, really interested audience there, Case. Oh, good. Um, all right. And I'll, and I'll be what in the. the I'll be in the. Um, I'll I'll be in the the other the post talk chat room as well, um, since I couldn't watch chat while doing this. But I'll be in that that one. Uh, so if there's if we run out of time, I'm happy to keep talking there. Yeah, we've still got time for a, a, f a couple more questions live. Um, rapidly being upvoted right now is what is the overall performance impact of turning all the safeties on? Um, almost nothing. Um, the, the sizes are, it's great. I mean, most of the stuff is compile time and then adding a check like this tends to uh, end up with one, one compare added which gets m totally lost um, in, in the overall work because you're about to do a, a mem copy usually in, into you know, an area you've, you know, the, the memory is already hot, there's all these other things, um, and even the branches don't, don't appear to be measurably different. Um, it adds a tiny about, uh, amount of image size because you're adding a couple bytes for the instructions to do the checks, but it's, it's almost nothing. Uh, which is kind of nice because it's a it's a very very low cost and it's deterministic that uh, that's great when um such significant improvements <laughs> like that don't come at too much of a cost yeah it's so good um okay what's next i noticed one of the copy macros included a mem set call zeroing the dust is this a behavior change mm -hmm. um it might be. It depends on on what the uh, what the prior code was doing. Um, the I would argue that it's a correct it's a it's a correctness change, and that if it is it if it is a behavior change, that's a problem because that means something was depending on an old value that wasn't being cleared. Uh, since we're uh, it, since what's being allocated is the entire structure plus the trailing arrays, um, you want to have initialized the rest of the structure. Uh, and if you haven't, that's a problem um, and a flaw in itself. Uh, normally, when you look at um, the code for these things, you'll have an allocation, and then a, it'll set a whole bunch of members within the structure, and then it'll do the copy, etc. Um, so adding the mem set. Um, would seem like it might be redundant in these cases, but luckily that stuff will get elided by the compiler when the compiler tries to do the compile because it sees a mem set, but then it sees later writes uh, that are that are being put into the same place, and it'll just get rid of the zeroing that happens in all the places that it can. Um, so you usually end up with absolutely no difference in, in the final binary output. Sorry, I'm just grinning wildly because I have definitely myself both written and fixed code that has been unknowingly dependent on on bugs or gaps in the in the language itself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm very familiar with that. Um, okay, we've got time for one more question live. What is the second most common cause of CVEs? Second most common? I'm not sure this is even the most common, but. Um... <laughs> I haven't gone through to to analyze them lately. Um, I'd say, I'd say probably this may be the second most common. Uh, I'd say probably one of the largest 
issues that the kernel is still dealing with is uh, use after free. So just dealing with temporal problems with um, bad code, freeing uh, a, a portion of memory that it thinks uh, is no longer being used, but something else is using it. Um, there's a lot of causes for that. Some of that is arithmetic overflow, which is going to be another piece that we're going to take a look at once once this is nailed down. Um, but yeah, I would say use after free, arithmetic overflow, and buffer overflows are related. They're interrelated and uh, the, some of the major problems with C yeah. generally. <laughs> <laughs> the tricky ones from yeah. my limited memory of C. All right, Kay, we are out of time. So there are still a couple more questions in the questions tab. Uh, we will vo copy them over to the the post talk chat Kaya Theater text channel, which is okay. over in the in Venulus in the in the tab. If it's not appearing for you in the channel list, um, click the browse all channels and find post talk chat Kaya Theater and join that. Um, Case will head over to there for a bit of a chat during the break. Awesome. Um, so thank you very much for your talk, Case. Awesome. I'm pretty you. sure you're going to get a lot of questions in the chat. Um, <laughs> And Happy have night. have a have a good quick break everyone and we will be back cool. shortly. Awesome. Thank you. Bye.